This edition of Space Time is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash space time. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or your MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com forward slash space time for your free audiobook. This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 5 for broadcast on the 18th of January 2017. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You can download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast just about everywhere, including iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, Bytes.com, YouTube, SoundCloud, Audioboom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Space Time, new evidence that some of the Milky Way's most distant stars were stolen from neighbouring galaxies. The Moon is much older than we previously thought, and Hubble provides an interstellar roadmap for the Voyager spacecraft. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has confirmed that some of the most distant stars in our Milky Way galaxy were probably stolen from neighbouring galaxies. The findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal and on the pre-press physics website archive.org are based on a study of 11 distant Milky Way stars, all located about 300,000 light years away and well beyond the Milky Way spiral disk. The new research shows that almost half of these stars were most likely gravitationally ripped from another galaxy the Sagittarius Dwarf Elliptical or Spheroidal Galaxy, a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. The stars are contained in a stellar tidal stream, extending over a million light years across space, linking the two galaxies. The stream is some ten times the length of the Milky Way itself. The Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is currently in the process of being consumed by the Milky Way through a process called galactic cannibalism. It's how small galaxies get bigger. The galaxy is expected to pass through the Milky Way within the next 100 million years. The Sagittarius Stream is a trail of stars in polar orbit around the Milky Way which have been leached from the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. The study's lead author, Marion Dietrich, from the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, describes the stellar stream as being more like a creek compared to the giant stellar rivers still predicted to be eventually found. The Sagittarius Dwarf is the largest of a dozen or so dwarf galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way. It has a diameter of about 8,500 light-years, compared to the 100,000 light-year diameter of the Milky Way itself. Earlier observations indicate the Sagittarius Dwarf has multiple stellar populations. These estimates are based on the composition of stars within the galaxy, which range in age from the oldest globular clusters, which are almost as old as the universe itself, through to extremely young trace stellar populations just a few hundred million years old. Over the 13.8 billion year history of the universe, the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy has made several loops around the Milky Way. On each orbit, the Milky Way's gravitational tides have tugged on the smaller galaxy, literally pulling it apart and ripping stars off it. Dietrich and a PhD advisor, Harvard theorist Avi Loeb, used computer models to simulate the movements of the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy over the past 8 billion years. They then varied the satellite galaxy's initial velocity and angle of approach to the Milky Way to determine what best matched the current observations. Avi Loeb says the starting speed and approach angle have a big effect on the orbit, just as the speed and angle of a missile launch affects its ultimate trajectory. At the beginning of the simulation, the Sagittarius Dwarf contained about 10 billion times the mass of our Sun. That's equivalent to about 1% of the Milky Way's mass. The team's calculations showed that over time, the Dwarf Galaxy lost about a third of its stars and a massive 90% of its dark matter. This resulted in three distinct streams of stars, which reach as far as a million light years from the centre of the Milky Way. In fact, they stretch all the way out to the very edge of the Milky Way halo, displaying one of the largest structures on the observable sky. The authors found that about five of the 11 most distant stars in our galaxy that they measured have positions and velocities that match what you'd expect to find from stars being stripped off the Sagittarius Dwarf. 
Now, while the other six don't appear to be from Sagittarius, it seems they were probably removed from another satellite dwarf galaxy. In fact, astronomers have already mapped several streams of stars which appear to be moving through the Milky Way in slightly different directions and speeds to the majority of stars in the Milky Way. A good example, the Virgo stellar stream, is a stream of stars that's believed to have once been an orbiting dwarf galaxy that's already been completely distended by the Milky Way's gravity. Science's understanding of dark matter predicts that there should be hundreds of dwarf galaxies orbiting around big galaxies like the Milky Way and Andromeda. However, so far, only about 50 small dwarf galaxies have been found within 1.4 million light years of the Milky Way. And not all of them are necessarily in orbit around the Milky Way. Some may themselves be in orbit around other satellite galaxies or just passing by. The only ones visible to the unaided eye are the large and small Magellanic Clouds, two southern hemisphere galaxies which have been observed since prehistory. Measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope in 2006 suggest that both Magellanic Clouds are moving too fast to be orbiting the Milky Way and may just be passing by. Mapping projects like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey have already charted one of the three stellar streams predicted by simulations to be coming from the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, but it hasn't yet determined the full extent which the models suggest. Future instruments like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which will detect much fainter stars across the sky, should be able to identify the other streams. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The Earth's moon is at least 4.51 million years old. That's between 40 million and 140 million years older than previously thought. The findings reported in the journal Science Advances are based on a new analysis of zircons found in lunar minerals brought back to Earth by the Apollo 14 mission in 1971. Scientists are already pretty confident that our moon was formed as a result of a giant impact when a Mars-sized planet called Thea collided at an acute angle with the early proto-Earth some 4.5 billion years ago. The collision melted both bodies and flung a sea of molten ejected debris into orbit around the Earth, which eventually coalesced to form the Moon. But exactly when this colossal impact occurred is still something of a hotly debated topic among astronomers. Scientists have been trying to settle the question for many years using a wide range of different scientific techniques. This new study's lead author, Melanie Barboni, from the University of California, Los Angeles, says her team were finally able to pin down the age of the collision to within 60 million years of the birth of the solar system, 4.6 billion years ago. It's an important point because it provides crucial information for astronomers and planetary scientists seeking to better understand the early evolution of both the Earth and the solar system. That's been a difficult task because everything that was on Earth before the giant impact's been erased. While scientists may never know precisely what happened before the Thea collision, the new findings are important because they'll help scientists continue to piece together major events which followed the giant impact. It's usually difficult to determine the exact age of moon rocks because most of them contain a patchwork of fragments from multiple other rocks. However, the authors found eight zircons in pristine condition in the Apollo moon rock samples they analysed. Zircons are important because they act as time capsules, preserving minerals and their chemical composition to reveal their geologic history and provide clues as to where they originated. Many elements are known to undergo radioactive decay from one element or isotope to another at a set rate known as a half-life. And so by knowing the half-life of a specific element and then knowing the ratios of the two elements involved in that, they can determine the age of the sample. The team used mass spectrometers at both Princeton University and UCLA to examine the ratio of uranium to lead and the decay of lutetium to hafnium inside their zircon samples. And by combining the data from both analyses, they were able to determine the Moon's age. You see, the Earth collision with Thea created a liquefied Moon, which then solidified. Scientists believe most of the Moon's surface was covered with magma right after the collision. The uranium-lead ratio measurements reveal exactly when the zircons first appeared in the Moon's initial magma ocean, which later cooled down to form the Moon's mantle and crust. And the lutetium hafnium measurements take that back a step earlier to reveal when this magma formed. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. OK, time to take a quick break from the show and talk about one of our sponsors. Yeah, there are many times when you can't hold a book, but you can listen to one, such as when you're commuting, when you're at the gym, jogging or walking the dog. 
And that's when I listen to Audible. It's my audio bookstore. And you know, I love the idea of someone reading to me. And no one offers a greater selection than Audible. In fact, they've got something like 180,000 titles plus to choose from. Audible's great if, like me, you have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Audible means you can learn so much. And right now, Audible has a special deal for space-time listeners. Audible's offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. And they've got so many great books to choose from. All the best sellers, the classics, science fiction, science fact, history, biography, whatever, often from the people who actually wrote them. How about Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen, narrated by Bruce Springsteen? Or The Life of Keith Richards, narrated by Johnny Depp, Joe Hurley and Keith Richards himself? No matter what your taste, there are over 180,000 titles to choose from. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime. That's audibletrial.com forward slash spacetime for your free audiobook. Or just click on the link at spacetimewithstuartgary.com. And now, back to our show. Scientists in Australia have developed a new optical telescope chip which will enable astronomers to have a clearer view of alien planets capable of supporting life. Seeing a planet outside of our solar system, which is close to its host star, that is in the star's habitable zone, is extremely difficult with today's standard astronomical instruments because of the glare coming from the host star. And the sort of planets which are likely to have life on them are most likely going to be found within the habitable zone of a star that is the area around the star where temperatures would allow liquid water, essential for life as we know it, to exist on a planet's surface. Associate Professor Steve Madden from the Australian National University says the new telescope chip removes light from the host star, thereby allowing astronomers for the first time to take a clear image of the target planet. Physicists and astronomers at the ANU worked on the optical chip with researchers from the University of Sydney and the Australian Astronomical Observatory. The new optical chip builds on 10 years of research in specialised optical materials and devices. It works in a similar way to noise-cancelling headphones. Harry Dean Kensington Goldsmith, who built the chip at the ANU Laser Physics Centre, says the chip's an interferometer, adding equal but opposite light waves from a host star, which then cancels out the light coming from that star, allowing the much weaker light being reflected by the planet to be seen. Because it looks in infrared, it uses the heat emitted by the planet to peer through dust clouds to see planets forming. To do this, astronomers need to understand exactly how and where planets form inside gas and dust clouds, so-called protoplanetary disks. Madden says ultimately the same technology will allow astronomers to detect ozone on alien planets, and that could be an indication of life. Today, when people try to do so-called direct imaging, where we're trying to look at the planets directly through a telescope, the state of the art for a long time has been something called a coronagraph, which is basically a system that blocks the starlight via a mechanical disk where the star appears in the field of view. It's sort of like an artificial eclipse, really, isn't it? Exactly. And you have to do this because the star is very much brighter than the uh, the light emanating off the planets by sort of, you know, a million times of that kind of order, maybe more depending on the, si the relative sizes, the distance from the star. Etc. So you've got a huge contrast problem that you have to overcome by getting rid of the starlight. And so, yes, you can put this disk in place, but the problem is that uh, you get light leakage around this disk. And there are great problems in um, reducing that level of light leakage to a level that you can see the planets. It can be done, but it usually means you need a disk, if you like, that's somewhat larger than the star. And that means that you can't see very close into the star. And you can't typically see with a coronagraph into what's referred to as the habitable zone, which is the same dis sort of distance that Earth is from our sun. And of course, that's the interesting place you'd like to look. And there are also issues with what range of wavelengths this works over and as I said before, just how much uh, extinction you can actually get. So this chip works on a completely different principle. It doesn't try to block light in the image plane. What it does instead is it works a bit like a set of noise-cancelling headphones. So in a noise-cancelling headphone, you sample the noise that you want to get rid of, and then you sort of turn it upside down so the peaks become troughs and the troughs become peaks, and then you add that back into your music so that when the external noise source and the music come together in your ear, the 
the peaks in the noise are cancelled by the trough in the added inverted noise and the noise disappears. So we do exactly the same with the starlight. We sort of invert it, add it to itself and cancel it out. And can this be added to any planet hunting telescope or does the telescope itself have to be rebuilt to handle this new chip? It's an add-on to a telescope. The, the key here though is that you really need to use quite large telescopes to get suitable signal levels. So we're talking 8 metre class telescope really and up. And the other thing that's important about this chip in that sense is that this technique has been applied before using chips but only in the near infrared and visible range of wavelengths and a lot of people who want to look for exoplanets want to look at them for either when they're forming which means that they're in the middle of a dust cloud and they're quite hot so you can't actually see through the dust cloud to see the exoplanet and so the way around that is to do what firefighters do and use the infrared so they use their infrared cameras to peer through the smoke and to see where the fire is happening. And that works because light in the infrared is scattered a great deal less than in the visible when you're going through a medium with lots of dust or smoke in it. Actually, people don't realise this, but people are actually more visible in the infrared than they are in visible light. That's right. And so, so indeed, in fact, are uh, forming exoplanets because they're usually at 1,000 degree type temperatures. And so that means that we can, A, get a lot more contrast because we've got a brighter planet, and B, we've also got the ability to see through the dust and reach the planets. So the big extra deal here is that this is the first time that anyone's been able to make a chip that works in the infrared to do that. And has it been applied on any telescopes as yet? Not yet, no. Uh, the, the main barrier to doing that is that this is perhaps the most critical component of the system to do this, but it's not the only component. And so there are a number of other researchers working on components that deliver the light into this chip, for example and they're not quite ready with those components yet. But I take it if you're talking about 8 metre range, that means Subaru, Keck, uh, VFT, and of course... Yep. The new telescopes being built now, the 30 metre range telescopes, which are so exciting. Yep, that indeed is correct. And the other thing that I hadn't said yet was that it relies on interferometry to do that cancellation. And that means that everything has to be super stable in terms of um, you can't have random variations in the optical paths that the light is going through. And the atmosphere, of course, is one source of those. So you have to have very good adaptive optics correction of atmospheric fluctuations. And that's only really installed on telescopes scopes like Subaru. And adaptive optics is like uh, you're making an artificial star high in the ionosphere and you shine a laser beam at that star and by looking at the distortion of that you can then compensate the mirrors through little actuators underneath the mirrors to make them move up and down many thousands of times per second to compensate for the changes in density and movement of molecules in the atmosphere. It's sort of like looking at the top of a swimming pool from the bottom of the swimming pool. Exactly, yes. I talked about the uh, fluctuations in the atmosphere. The other side of it is fluctuations in the telescope and the downstream optics. Having a chip enables you to, once everything's on the chip, it doesn't move. So it's insensitive to vibration, relatively insensitive to temperature and everything else. So by putting it on a chip, you get the stability to do the interference. Okay, so where to next? Well, the other angle that the chip gives us is the materials that it's made of are actually transparent much further up into the mid-infrared than we will initially be using them. And that's where the, the sort of alien life form opportunity comes in, in that um, if you look at around the 10 micron range, which is sort of equivalent to the Earth's temperature now, you will find find that there is a characteristic absorption there that allows you to identify the presence of ozone. And ozone is a very important biomarker for uh, life processes that are like those on Earth. So first we get it working at a range of wavelengths to look for forming planets, understand the issues, get all the instrumentation working, and then we go on and basically just change the dimensions of the device and look at 10 microns to go looking for ozone and potentially life. And that, of course, is the big banana, isn't it, finding life on another planet? And, and even if we don't find life, that, that's just as scary, isn't it, that if we are the only ones there are in the universe? Yeah, well, I think it will take us a long time to make our minds up on that as there's so many stars and planetary systems to look for in that. It's a great time to be a planetary scientist right now and a planet hunter because uh, we're now at that stage where we're opening this new vista of exploration. We now know that pretty well every star out there most likely has a planet or more than one planet in many cases orbiting around it. And some of those planets are bound to be in the habitable zone. Indeed, yes. That's Associate Professor Steve Madden from the Australian National University. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary.
NASA's Hubble Space Telescope is being used to study the flight paths of the space agency's twin Voyager spacecraft, allowing astronomers to see exactly what it is that probes are now flying through. The two Voyager spacecraft are hurtling through unexplored territory on their journeys beyond our solar system. Along the way, they're measuring the mysterious environment between stars known as the interstellar medium. Even after the Voyagers finally run out of electrical power and are therefore unable to transmit data back to Earth, and that could happen in about a decade, astronomers will still be able to use the Hubble observations to characterise the environments through which these silent ambassadors will be gliding. A preliminary analysis of the Hubble observations reveals a rich complex interstellar ecology containing multiple clouds of hydrogen laced with other elements. The Hubble data combined with that of the Voyagers has also provided new insights into how the Sun itself travels through interstellar space. The study's lead author, Seth Redfield from Wesleyan University in Connecticut, says it's a great opportunity to compare data from the in-situ measurements of the space environment being made by the Voyager spacecraft with that from telescopic measurements by Hubble. The Voyagers are sampling tiny regions as they plough through space at about 62,000 kilometres per hour. The problem is astronomers have no real idea whether these small areas are typical or rare. And that's where the Hubble observations come in. They provide scientists with a broader view because the telescope is looking along a deeper and wider path. In other words, Hubble's giving some context to what each of the voyages are passing through. The astronomers hope that the Hubble observations will help them characterise the physical properties of the local interstellar medium. NASA launched the twin Voyager spacecraft, Voyagers 1 and 2, back in 1977. Their mission was nothing less than the grand tour of the outer solar system, made possible because of planetary alignments which allowed the spacecraft to use the gravity assist of each planet to slingshot them along to the next. Both probes explored the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn, while Voyager 2 then went on to visit the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. Now these pioneering spacecraft are exploring the very outermost edge of the Sun's domain. Voyager 1 officially left the solar system a few years ago, it's now flying through interstellar space, the region between the stars that's filled with gas, dust and material recycled from dying stars. Voyager 1's now some 21 billion kilometres away, making it the most distant human-made object ever built. In about 40,000 years, Voyager 1 will pass within 1.6 light-years of the star Gliese 445. Its twin, Voyager 2, is now some 17 billion kilometres away and it will pass within 1.7 light-years of the star Ross 248 in about 40,000 years. For the next 10 years until they finally run out of power, the Voyager spacecraft will continue making measurements of interstellar material, magnetic fields and cosmic rays along their trajectories. Hubble complements the Voyager's observations by gazing at two sight lines along each spacecraft's path in order to map the interstellar structure along their star-bound routes. Each sight line stretches over several light years to nearby stars. By sampling the light from those stars, Hubble Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph can measure how interstellar material absorbs some of the starlight, leaving telltale spectral signatures in the process. Hubble's already found that the Voyager 2 spacecraft will move out of the local bubble, that's an interstellar gas cloud that surrounds the solar system, in a couple of thousand years. Based on the Hubble data, the astronomers predict that the spacecraft will spend about 90,000 years in a second cloud and then pass into a third interstellar cloud. An inventory of the cloud's composition reveals slight variations in the abundance of chemical elements contained in the structures. These variations could mean that the clouds formed in different ways or from different areas before finally coming together. An initial look at the Hubble data also suggests that the Sun is passing through clumpy material in nearby space which may affect the heliosphere, the large bubble containing our solar system which is produced by the Sun's solar wind. At its boundary, known as the heliopause, the solar wind pushes outwards against the interstellar medium. Hubble and Voyager 1 have already made measurements of the interstellar environment beyond this boundary, where the wind comes from stars other than the Sun. It seems the heliosphere is compressed when the sun moves through dense material, but then expands back out again when the star passes through lower density matter. This expansion and contraction is caused by the interaction between the outward pressure of the solar wind composed of streams of charged particles and the pressure of the interstellar material surrounding the sun. That's the show for now. 
You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. The show is also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. This is Space Time with Stuart Gary. For more, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Tumblr. Just search for Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe.